Without much further ado, please, our future, our choice. Thirty-four to forty-five, it was fifty-two percent remain. The age group of twenty-five to thirty-four, sixty-two percent. Eighteen to twenty-four, seventy-five percent. The gen and <laughs> which means that mathematically, in less than five years, by twenty twenty-one, mathematically, we have a population that voted to remain. And at that point, Brexit won't be complete. The things that Brexiters wanted won't be complete. You can't re-legislate a country, as in make all your own laws and have all your own trade deals, which means negotiating trade deals with hundreds of countries around the world. Brexit takes two years, and, and they're not even going to finish it in two years. The idea that we could possibly um, make trade deals with countries around the world in, in five years is just ludicrous. And, that, and actually, based on what, what um, Michel Barnier and, and David Davis agreed today, it's looking like we're going to be following EU law, but without a say in it, which means that in the two years after Brexit, where, where you could possibly argue that we actually have, a, we still have a, ma a majority for Brexit, the only thing Brexit would have achieved is a loss of sovereignty. That's insane. <laughs> after which we have a population that voted heavily against Brexit, and they'll be stuck with it. They'll be the ones li living with the consequences of it. And it's, it's, no, it's no coincidence that young, younger people voted for Brexit. Because if you look at it, everyone born under, un, after the year 1974, which means roughly everyone that's aged roughly 42 or so years old and, and younger, their entire adult lives, they've been both UK and EU citizens. That's because of when the Maastricht Treaty came about and brought about the notion of EU citizenship. It's the only identity we have ever known. We are EU citizens, we are UK citizens, and for us, being EU citizens only ampl amplifies, makes better what it means to be British. We consider ourselves part of the EU. We consider ourselves one with all of you in this room. And that's what's being stripped from us. And we're not gonna take it. Because quite, and, and this notion that young people will change their minds, they don't know what they're on about. Excuse me. I studied EU law in two universities. I have taken on Nigel Farage directly on five separate occasions. I managed to get Nigel Farage to admit live on his own radio show that we always had control over immigration under EU law that we simply weren't using, which goes directly against literally everything he said before, before, before the referendum. So this notion that young people don't know what they're talking about. I mean, this idea that we'll, we'll suddenly become Eurosceptics once we reach the age of 45, just a lie. <laughs> Surely the biggest um, factor in terms of our opinion of how, whether Brexit's a good idea or not is the facts that we're learning every single day. It's the, con it's the only thing you hear about in the news these days. And is it good news? Have you been hearing lots of good news that we're getting everything that we, vote, that we voted for, that everything that we've asked for from the EU? No, it's bad. And, and, and the thing is, the best people to, to tackle this are young people. Why? Because we're not the political establishment. We're not business experts with their own financial interests. We're young people looking to take back control of our futures. So, hi, hi my name is Callum. Um, I'm going to kind of change over from what Femi said a little bit. Um, so it's been a problem in this country for a long time. Uh, social issues and divisions have worsened. And at the same time, faith in politics and politicians has weakened. Um, that link between the people that we choose and trust to make our society a better and fairer place and the fact that we are in such a terrible state right now, that has to be addressed. And I think that that has to be addressed by understanding two things. Um, 
that Brexit is the symptom and not the cause. And getting caught up in this, uh, it's quite frankly shameful and very harmful distraction, that's gonna stop us from dealing with the root cause of why we are here in the first place. So that's the first understanding. And the second thing I think we have to understand is that we are in this together. This includes every single person living in the UK, whether you're a EU national or a UK citizen, or you're in Europe living as a EU citizen or a UK national. This process stands to benefit so few and if we let this happen, if we cross that line in the sand and set that precedent that says irrationality and manipulated decisions uh, can decimate the most vulnerable of us and impact the majority of us, then that won't just be echoed throughout the UK. It won't be echoed just throughout Europe but we will see that effect throughout the world. So yeah, that's why we're doing it. Okay, so I'm just gonna say a few words about what we've been doing so far and what we're planning to do over the next few months. So we launched a couple of months ago with an open letter in The Guardian to Jeremy Corbyn, asking him and pleading him to get off the fence on Brexit and to change his stance. Um, and to listen to young people who overwhelmingly want to stay in the European Union. So that was our start. Um, <laughs> we then decided that we would go, we travelled around the country, we went up to Hull, we decided we wanted to speak to a lot of young people, so we spoke to a lot of young people about how they saw our membership of the European Union and how they were angry and what they wanted to see done about it. So we've mobilised students across the country, we've got over 40 students uh, like universities who have student groups in their universities who have set up their own groups who are holding events talking to lots of different students and trying to mobilize them together so we can coordinate a big effort on this um, which is another thing we've been doing we've also been writing articles we've been creating a lot of content so we've had femis obviously been going on a lot of different media things so whether it's nigel farage or sky news or the big questions on sunday i don't know if you watched it he's been you know absolutely fantastic in spreading our message um, which has been great. And other ways that we've been doing it is we've been making creative content. So we've made, we've made an animation, um, we've made other videos. Callum had a very moving message to Westminster, which he always gets really humble about, but it was absolutely fantastic. Um, yeah, and that's kind of what we've been doing. And that's kind of in the vein that we want to continue. So we're going to continue making this content, we're going to continue mobilizing, and we're going to continue campaigning. So we really hope that you can support us. Thank you. Uh, hi, I'm Will. Um, in 1940, uh, Churchill told Hugh Dalton that his task was to set Europe ablaze. That was when we didn't have quite as good relations, although we might be heading that way now. Uh, but the task of OFAC is to set Whitehall ablaze. And one of the ways we're, we're going to do that is to uh, do this freedom of information campaign where young people, like much of the rest of the country, do not have a clue what Brexit actually means, as much as Theresa May does tell us what Brexit means. Uh, and <laughs> so we're going to mobilise hundreds of young people to ask different government departments what Brexit actually means and expose much of the waste and cost of Brexit. Uh, because, trust me, they're hiring an army of consultants, uh, of lawyers, of headhunters, of recruiters, and, you know, this notion that we've taken back control, that we've saved money, is obviously complete nonsense. Uh, what else, why are young people really important in this debate? Well, as Lara said, we launched with his open letter to Corbyn. Corbyn simply will not listen to the Blairites, to the centrists. We know this. But he might listen to the people who made him Labour leader in 2015 and then protected his status as a Labour leader in 2016. And then the reason that he actually surged in the general election in 2017. I know a lot of you people probably think that Corbyn's been a bit of a coward. And maybe I agree with you. But actually, he might listen to young people. And that's why it's really, really, really important that young people tell him that, yes, we agree with your analysis of society because society is kind of crumbling. But the only way to sort out those issues is actually to stop Brexit, and then we can start again from there. Another reason that I think young people are quite important in this process is because I think that we can talk to leavers in an emotional way that you know maybe the Remain campaign lacked uh, in 2016 and has lacked since. 
you know, I've got to confess in a room which is probably half full of Europeans, but I did vote leave. <gasps> but I didn't vote to, uh, to fuck all of you. You know, I'm sorry, I just didn't. I didn't vote to screw over the Irish. I didn't vote for chaos on the Northern Irish broader. I didn't vote for less money for our public services. I didn't vote for no control over the laws that this country would have. I didn't vote to give 50 billion uh, over the next four years, which we'll be paying back now in 2064, which means people who are unborn, you know, you know four-year-olds in 2064 will still be paying. <laughs> like, it's just absolute nuts on their Freddo bars. But anyway, whatever. Um, so I think we can talk. And so my whole family also voted to leave, but I know that they're not unreasonable people. We might be stubborn, but we're not entirely unreasonable as a people. And I do think that young people can actually convince many leavers that, uh, that this isn't what they were sold. That what Brexit looks like now is totally, totally, totally different to what it was in 2016, because the government, uh, you know, because Brexit has contradictions right at the heart of it. So I just want to end rather quickly before opening up to any questions by saying that if you support anything that we're doing, uh, because actually we're quite a lot like you, you know, young people are being ignored in this process, much like the Europeans. If you support anything we're doing, we all support you. Uh, then please head to our website, get involved, head to our Twitter, support us online. Thank you so much. <laughs>
a basic reading of the text, Article 50 says it's a notification of intention to withdraw. It doesn't mean we've left. It means we intend to leave. What happens when we no longer intend to leave? So yeah, and and it just, it, it just needs a, a vote on the a vote on the deal where, where the option to remain is on the table. And when the treat when the draft treaty goes back to Parliament in October, the Parliament, which majoritarily knows that Brexit is going to hurt the country, will have a choice. Do they accept a deal that will hurt the country, or do they essentially pass the buck back to us, wash their hands of it, and say, all right, you voted for this, if you really want it, you can vote for it. That's what we're looking at. And when the people see the, exactly how much these negotiations have failed, they, we believe that they'll reject it. Just on the, on the question of um, uh, the um, election last year, which left a less than majority government in place, one of the things that people don't realise is that uh, um, presumably Theresa May called the election because it meant that she could enshrine Brexit in her, in her manifesto in 2017. And because she doesn't have a majority, technically, um, the House of Lords is not, is not bound by that as normally it would be. The House of Lords, by convention, doesn't vote against manifesto commitments, but in, the, in this instance, it, it has the choice um, of making its own mind up. And I think it's very important for people to appeal to the members of the House of Lords and, and uh, push them into opposing the withdrawal bill as it goes through. I mean, I think it's very fitting that there'll be a great coalition between uh, a chamber full, full of old people and, and young people. And yeah, we'll absolutely work with uh, the House of Lords and anyone else who is willing to, to put their careers and uh, on the line to try and stop Brexit. And last question, maybe, because... Yeah, I was wondering, I heard Lara say that you have set up unions in the, in the universities, mm -hmm. but I think the people at college, you know, they're currently 16 years old, they are definitely the voters of the future in the next election. Have you got plans there to kind of reach out to those guys? Yeah, we do. And we've been fortunate enough that um, a, number of, a number of people who have worked at, worked at colleges or students even have actually directly got in contact with us before we've had to reach out to them, which has been amazing. But we are making yeah, a real concerted effort to get in touch with them too, because you're right. And I think that we will passionately campaign if there is another vote for 16-year-olds to be given that vote too, because it's just absolutely ridiculous that they wouldn't be given that, frankly. So There are also um, a large number of non-student Body, young people, uh, and we're reaching out to youth centres. Um, we're doing sports events, music events, creative events to make sure that this is as inclusive as possible because a lot of the reasons that we've got here is because opportunity is lacking in a lot of the parts of the country. And we, if we really seek to address that balance, they have to be heard, they have to be, be empowered, and this has to include every single one of us. So we're working towards that. Thank you very much.